Six years ago, there were really high levels of losses across the country. I was in Pennsylvania at the time, and a Pennsylvania beekeeper called, and he had brought, he had just the month before bragged about how great his bees were. They were boiling over, he said, and he brought them down to Florida like he does every year. And he describes going back to Florida and, and realizing something was wrong and getting on his hands and knees and looking at the entrances of hives and realizing that there weren't any bees in these colonies at all. It was like a ghost town. And it quickly became apparent this problem was happening in Florida and California. And so we got a working group together, started, started taking samples for something we would, we would call then colony collapse disorder or CCD. And what we're hoping to do then is use human epidemiological methods in order to identify risk factors. For instance, we've looked at fungicides and we know there's an increased risk for fungicide exposure. We know that there's increased risk with some of other chemical exposures. Um, and we also know that there's a big increased risk due to varroa mite, which are these large parasitic mites um, that are vampire mites sucking the blood of bees. Get a tick on you the size of a dinner plate. That's essentially at the same scale of one varroa mite on a bee. We look for the number of varroa in the hive to get an idea of the health of the hive. And if there's more than three mites per 100 bees, pretty much that colony is going to die. Now honeybees aren't native to North America, and so they were brought over, as were a lot of the crops, apples and other crops. And so what we do is, is as an industry, we need to be able to have this movable pollination force where we're bringing bees across the country to different crops to pollinate those crops. And without that, we wouldn't be able to produce food like we do in this country. They find our nectar source and then they come back to the hive and their dance signals to their sisters where the pollen or nectar is. They'll even like adjust it. So if they're doing like the same dance and like an hour goes by, they'll like adjust it a little According bit. According to the like sun, because the which sun way is the moved. sun's moving. Basically, it's one of the greatest evolutionary stories. We wouldn't have any flowers if it weren't for bees. It turns out that honeybees pollinate about one in every three bites of food we eat. Without bees, we wouldn't have apples, we wouldn't have almonds, we wouldn't have a lot of our nut crops, we wouldn't have the seeds that we need to grow a lot of our vegetables. And so while we wouldn't starve without honeybee pollination, we would be restricted in our diet to corn, wheats, and potatoes. Sometimes we get queens in here by mistake. I actually really enjoy it, and it's a part of a much bigger picture. And to be a part of that is, is really great. how you um, prepare a sample to check for Nesema. As long as the samples keep coming in, we'll keep doing them for sure. Um, trying to help beekeepers. Just to get an idea of what's going on inside their hive. We couldn't do this if we weren't hopeful, so we're always hopeful. I do worry that we're gonna lose a lot of established beekeepers in the interim. Of course, everyone can do something. If everyone added 10% of their backyard into native trees and native plants and pollinator plants, that would be the equivalent of adding three national parks to the country's landscape. The other idea of the green lawn is an archaic destructive force. And we need to have meadows, pollinator meadows. And there are lots of, of urban municipalities that would actually give you a ticket for making a pollinator habitat. We have to get out of this sort of old way of thinking that these perfectly green mowed lawns are beautiful things, that they're high status symbols. They actually should be symbols of shame.
Well, it's frustrating to see when they're going along the roads spraying, uh, and I'm talking about the state killing, and there's a lot of wildflowers along the road that they, they spray and kill. You gotta control some but a lot of it doesn't have to be as much as it is. Uh, it just bothers me to see anybody with a sprayer spraying something that I know is gonna affect my bees. If you get by with losing under 25% each year, consider yourself lucky. Some people's lost as many as half. One year I did, I lost half my bees. A little less this year than normal so far. The year ain't, uh, the summer ain't started yet, so you really don't know how many more you're going to lose. More of our farmland is becoming housing developments. All right, that's taken away from the habitat of what the bees has to work with, okay? When they put their little pretty flowers out and they spray them because they got insects on them, then those bees hit those early because that's the first flowers they find. That's what people sets out and they come back to the hive with that contamination and that early cam contamination is what's going to kill that early brood and that early brood is what needs to really get them cranking. Over the winter they'll cluster around the queen they keep her in the middle they need to keep her at 92.7 degrees so she won't uh, freeze and her eggs become duds 40 to 45 days is the lifespan of a honeybee. They work herself to death, literally. Both of my son-in-laws is allergic to bees. Granddaughter's allergic to bees. Uh, I have nobody really that's family that could pick up where I leave off. Bayer has a lot of merit-based products. Merit and Machloroprid is a systemic chemical that pretty much takes care of everything. You can't eat it and it's not great for the bees. But Merit's the chemical that they're blaming for a lot of the, the disappearing bees and them getting sick and all of these products pretty much contain it, but homeowners love it because it takes care of things quickly. I wouldn't use them myself. It's doing something to mess with their timing and sense of direction. All these things all kill the bees. Well, there was extensive flooding one year and it was impossible for me to uh, do the traditional mowing uh, in most of the side quarter acre of the property. And I said, well, let's take a different approach. And I spoke with my wife and we did extensive research. I think it's really paid off. I think we have something very unique here. We have hawks coming. And, and just sitting uh, just to catch a mouse or, or a, uh, a vole oh. that might be running around in the meadow. We have a blue heron that regularly visits our brook. We've brought back and encouraged other native species to come in, native birds. Insects. Insects, snakes, frogs, toads. It all builds upon itself. I've never had that happen. I send a letter out, people cut their lawn. Myself, I think he did it probably to upset the, his neighbors, but then again, he seems to like his meadow. I'm to enforce complaints. Um, I'm not to drive out with my own opinion and say, oh, that's obnoxious, you know, that's weeds, that's no good. It's all pretty much, if the neighborhood likes it, it's fine. They came here from Bergen County and they wanted this to be like Bergen County, but they wanted it to be a little slice of the country. Voices got loud, his wife came, came out, out, profanities were swung. And he was threatened <laughs> with a gun. The, the land ethic that they brought here was very different than the land ethic 
that's already here. People come from different backgrounds. People around here mow their property, put fertilizers and all those things that uh, contribute to the, the pollution of the brook. <coughs> Most towns do adopt something to maintain property. Obnoxious growth is obnoxious growth. I would say it's natural, uh, national code. In the ordinance it says I can hire somebody to cut the lawn and then the, it gets billed to the homeowner. And then if they don't pay it, then it gets put in a lien on their property. Mr. Gravan said he did plant some flowers in there, but that was only after he had to go to court. They just kept pursuing it. And I was a zoning officer for this town. So the person who now holds my, the job that I used to hold back in 1985 cited me for the violation. And the prosecutor, who happened to be uh, Senator, Senator. Senator Kip Bateman, they blamed our meadow on the snakes. Oh, and the asthma. The, the and asthma. The, and the rats. And it was like they were here before we let the grass grow. We were mowing the lawn and there were snakes over there because of the brook. There's concern about the salt content of our waterways. Deep-rooted native grasses filters that salt from the runoff on the road, which uh, allows minnows, uh, species to grow, which makes a brook healthy, which all feed into the north branch of the Raritan River, which is a trout river. If it were grass, it would be sheet flow. They uh, try to campaign with uh, the you know, a community to stand up to me. And uh, judge ruled the way he did. I'm glad he ruled. I'm glad it wasn't left open there. I can't use obnoxious growth anymore. Okay. So if people call me up to complain about a lawn, it's going to be weeds. It has a definition in the International Boca Code. If we put that in the ordinance that describes weeds as grasses, plants, um, and a few other things, and then it excludes cultivated gardens and um, plants and, that are in gardens and everything. So it pretty much describes everything. The two big nectar sources in Maryland are two types of trees. They're called the tulip poplar and the black locust. And I don't really think that they're producing a lot of nectar right now, but they will in the next couple of weeks. Right now, these bees are probably out foraging on, uh, you know, the flowers that the landscape that the landscapers on campus have been planting. Well, what is it about the lawn? The only people that could afford lawns in the back in the good old days were the rich people because they could afford to have it chopped and they didn't need to have sheep eating the grass. I think it's this notion that's been brought down from our colonial past. You know, we spill the equivalent of the Exxon Valdez in gasoline every year filling up our lawnmowers in America. Lawns use more water per acre than any other agricultural crop. If we just simply change the way we think of beauty, if we can make that cultural shift, we can make dramatic impact.